welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memory Show through iTunes or by plugging our RSS feed into your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on Spotify, YouTube, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to the iTunes store, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for us. Maybe that'll inspire Apple to promote us a little. And of course, you can also promote us by telling people about the podcast on social media or however else you publicize the things you like. You can support the Virtual Memories Show and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. You'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and help me continue to produce smart conversation about books, art, comics, and culture every week at the Virtual Memories Show. Well, you're getting this episode from the road and my voice is a little bit shot. Sorry. I am in between events right now at the Bethesda North Marriott in Rockville, Maryland. The Small Press Expo, SPX, just finished, and I'm about to host my annual meeting and conference for my day job, a two-day series of presentations and networking events for the member companies of the Pharmaceutical Trade Association I represent. Um, It is a weird transition, I'll be honest, going from arts podcast guy to biopharma outsourcing executive. Um, But I'll deal. Although there are times I'm not really sure which one constitutes a secret identity for me. But anyway, uh, SPX was good. I only got one podcast in with the artist David Small, who has a new book out called Home After Dark. That one will go up in a few weeks. But I had a lot of other nice conversations. I got to to catch up with some old friends, uh, pick up some good comics, figure out some potential guests in future. So, um, productive. Now, this week's guest is the author and artist Audrey Niffenegger. Audrey's best known for her debut novel, The Time Traveler's Wife, but she's got a significant body of work since then. Now, I first checked Audrey's work out earlier this year uh, because of her new book, Bizarre Romance, from Abrams. Uh, Bizarre Romance is a collection of shorter pieces, like stories and monologues, that were adapted into comics or otherwise illustrated uh, by Audrey's husband, Eddie Campbell, who is one of my all-time favorite cartoonists and somebody who was on the dream list I put together early on when I was trying to figure out who I'd actually want to interview on the show. So when I pitched Eddie on doing the podcast about both this and his new history book, The Goat Getters, he said I ought to record with Audrey too, since they'd made this collaborative work. Um, I agreed, but said I'd like to interview them separately because... I hate having to do three-person sessions. I hate talking to two people at the same time, uh, on or off mic, frankly, uh, because it means trying to figure out the dynamic between them, and especially when doing a podcast, trying to sometimes coax the second person into talking more if the first person is is talking too much. Now, it worked out really well with Paul Karasik and Mark Newgarden a few months ago, but they they had this down. Like, they, they'd done this so often, they they had the whole thing you know, put together. Um, but Eddie agreed and, uh, they were up for it. So I read Audrey's prose books, checked out her artwork online and tried to figure out a time to get out to Chicago to record with them. That time turned out to be never. Uh, but since they were coming in for the Brooklyn book festival last weekend and all I had going on was prepping for SPX and my own conference and quarterly board meeting and secret meeting with the FDA and all sorts of other stuff. I figured, well, why don't we just get together in New York the day before I leave town? And here we are. So as caveats go, 
I couldn't turn off the air conditioning in the apartment we were using to record, uh, and it had some variable phases that would turn on and off, so they were a little tough to remove from the audio file, at least on my travel laptop. Um, I might remaster this episode when I have more time. It'll be the same content. I might just tweak the audio a bit. Uh, the plus side is, because of the AC and the configuration of the apartment, neither Eddie nor Audrey could actually hear my conversation with the other one. So um, they'll have some secrets until, you know, these episodes actually post. Here's Audrey's bio. There's a more comprehensive one at her website, audreyniffenegger.com, but this is the one that comes with Bizarre Romance. Audrey Niffenegger is the author of the international bestsellers The Time Traveler's Wife and Her Fearful Symmetry, as well as a fine artist who has published four illustrated books with Abrams, The Three Incestuous Sisters, The Adventurous, Raven Girl, and The Night Bookmobile. And now, the virtual memories conversation with Audrey Niffenegger. Do you have more friends who are uh, in the arts or outside the arts? Uh, by now it might be half and half, but originally I had far more friends who are visual artists than anything else because that's what I trained as. Mm -hmm. So I went to the School of the Art Institute of Chicago and then Northwestern and trained as a printmaker, photographer, painter. And so... For a long time, also I've been teaching in the visual arts for years and years, so when I was first trying to publish a novel, I didn't actually know anybody <laughs> who knew anybody, so it took a long time to get up to speed with uh, knowing other writers. Do you regret knowing other writers at this point, or are no, you okay with them? <laughs> I don't know how familiar you are with Chicago's literary scene, but people are very lovely and Definitely. I always check out that, that Lit 50 thing. I, I, it's not the Chicago Reader. I forget. Shoot me in the head. Well, I, I usually look at it for potential guests when I, I get out there, but, you know, since, since Irvin Welsh left, you know, it, it kind of... Uh, well, it's full of interesting people. It's just that it doesn't even begin to cover the, the breadth or excitement of the scene because... Um, I mean, this business of ranking is ridiculous. Like, yeah. like the idea that a scene has verticality rather than being horizontal is kind of silly. You could run them alphabetically, I suppose, or by height, which, yeah, in which case yeah. Eddie would come off pretty well, I, I suppose. <laughs> I don't, there's some tall people in Chicago, but yeah, I mean, there's. I think they should start organizing it by, you know, yeah, random things like, you know, who calls back fastest or the zodiac sign. Always good. Yeah. Too. yeah. <laughs> uh, how long has Chicago been home? Uh, I, Is it home? Yeah, home, home. I grew up there. Um, I grew up in Evanston. And um, I was born in Michigan, but we moved to Evanston when I was two. So, uh, and I just sort of keep living there. And now Eddie lives there. <laughs> yeah. Is it the only place you'd call home? We are in London a lot of the time. And my solicitor in London says I should never say that I live there. For tax reasons? For immigration reasons. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> like, you know, yeah, like they'll they'll send a, a squad to come and, you know, rebuff me at a Heathrow next time or something. But uh, we're there a lot, let's mm -hmm. put it that way. <laughs> hey, what brought you there initially? Uh, I started going to London because uh, I had been reading so many English books for years and years since I was a tiny thing. And then my sister, in 1996, won a pair of free plane tickets to anywhere. And we decided we would go to London, so that's what we did. <laughs> <laughs> and Highgate Cemetery was, was part we, of that? Or yeah, that my sister, later? yeah, my sister and I went on the tour of Highgate uh, back in 96, when it was considerably less uh, put together than it is now. It was way creepier in 96 than it is at the moment. Do you feel responsible for its its decreepinessing? Uh, just no. because it was a centerpiece of your second prose novel, we should explain to the, the listeners. But. Yeah, I, I started going to Highgate Cemetery a lot in 2003 because I was researching Her Fearful Symmetry, which is set there. And 
I don't claim responsibility for Highgate resurrecting because that work had been going on since the early 80s, and there's a group called the Friends of Highgate Cemetery that have brought it literally back from the dead. I mean, that cemetery was closed at one point. Half of it was, anyway. But I got to know the people who did save it, and um, some of them allowed me to base characters on them. So that was a thrill and uh, a very interesting situation. Did you feel you needed permission? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, when I was a freshman at art school, I took a class on documentary photography, and uh, I was always trying to weasel out of it in a way. Like, yeah. our our professor brought us to this home for children with um, physical and mental disabilities and sort of set us free and said, here, go photograph. And I was like, I'm not going to take pictures of these kids because they cannot consent. Mm -hmm. um, because they're kids, for one thing. Yeah. But I'm not just going to run around, like, you know, staring at them and taking their picture. And that experience got me thinking, well, I don't ever want to be that person who's going around vampiring everybody into my art. Like, I always want to be collaborating rather than just sucking people in and squeezing them dry. Does vampirism play any, any other role in your, your life or art? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm afraid not. I'm just um, wondering, you know, especially I know, with the, the scenery here. There's, there's a little... Uh, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so I, I decided way back when I was 18 that I was... Uh, that if I was doing something which involved real people that I would be getting permission. And so when I wanted to base characters on Jean Pateman and her husband John, I asked Jean Pateman because it seemed yeah. like a good idea. And uh, she became a major character because she said yes. She took all of five minutes to decide that that was okay, but I had really worried about it because I didn't know what she would say. And mm -hmm. so, Was she afraid of how she'd be represented or that she'd be used in a she weird was, purpose? She was very protective of the cemetery and not at all protective mm. of herself. Okay. Although... I had promised her, even before I tried to base a character on her, I had promised her that she would see mm -hmm. the manuscript before it got turned in. So uh, it was that was a very tense thing. Um, so I gave it to her, and she spent a week reading it, and she made all these notes in this very tiny, unreadable handwriting, and I'm like, I have no idea what is coming <laughs> down the pike at me. And then... At the end of the week, we sat down in one of the cemetery's offices, and she's like, well, my dear, I feel we should discuss this. And then she proceeded mm -hmm. to give me her notes, which were pretty much correcting my Americanisms and yeah. a certain amount of fact-checking about the cemetery, and that was pretty much all she mm -hmm. asked to be changed. Did she give a vibe that she actually enjoyed it? Or yeah. simply with that British reserve, no, not being she, critical was enough to, no, uh, to signal she, it? She liked it, I think. <laughs> now, let me ask... Your first novel was a big hit, sold well, became a movie. Um, how did that phenomenon affect you as a, an artist in terms of subsequent work? Did you feel either a damned if you do, damned if you don't in terms of I need to replicate this sort of book or a sense of I am tremendously liberated now and can do what I want to do for my next project? Um... While I was writing The Time Traveler's Wife, I was working a very demanding job. I was um, a full-time professor at Columbia College in Chicago, which is a private arts college. And I had helped found a program and a book and paper center. And so I just worked all the time there. Mm -hmm. And so I was writing the novel in kind of the crevices of time that were left over. And... When the novel came out and I had to tour, I had to step back from doing all those things. And so it, I wouldn't say that it necessarily changed me as an artist. It changed me as a person who was able to control their own time. Mm -hmm. So instead of having to sort of beg, borrow, and steal the time I had to work on my own stuff, I got to basically buy my freedom and uh, yeah that, that's what i'm wondering was yeah. there a sense of constraint in terms of i'm successful or and i need i now have an audience i need to satisfy or what you're saying instead just that 
I don't have to do this now. I, I can think about what I want to do. And again, your day job exigencies yeah. aren't as critical. I mean, all the books I've published since then have really been quite different from The Time Traveler's Wife, although I'm now working on a sequel to The Time Traveler's Wife, which is due in January, yay. Um, and I've, I've felt stranger about doing the sequel than I have about any of the unrelated yeah. things in between, because the sequel has to extend and work with the original thing in a way that justifies its existence and yeah. isn't just, you know... Please give me more of your money. <laughs> right. And that's it's a sort of what I'm, I'm wondering, those, those yeah. pressures and um, what it means to have an audience. It's a joke I always tell, not actually having one myself. I, I wonder, you know, about Aww. the... But, you know, wondering what it's... Um, do, you, do you have an idea of how many people listen? Yeah, but it, it's, uh, it doesn't make me happy. But it's okay. It's, uh, and I do this out of, out of love because, again, we've discussed what my day job is. Sure, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I, I do things like this to, uh, to zero out my karma. And, and it is a decent audience in terms of numbers and especially in terms of devotion to books and conversation, which is what I really care about. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, that sense of, of knowing that you had an audience for your work. Well... I mean, because I spent six years being an art student and then taught in MFA programs for years and years and years, um, the critique process is very um, stringent. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, really there's, at least in my head, there's not that much difference between a gazillion people read this and therefore you better measure up or the people in this room looked at this thing, and therefore you better be able to answer some questions. Gotcha. So uh, I, I guess what art school is good for is giving you that kind of steel skin so that you can kind of survive whether nobody pays attention or everybody pays attention or whether everybody pays attention and then they all go away. Yeah. So as an art school teacher... Um, what do you wish you knew as an art student when you were starting out? Something that I've been endeavoring to give my students is a sense of what happens after art school. Yeah. Um, I got my BFA in 1985 when they just didn't do the business of art mm -hmm. at all. They just did all this theory and uh, some skills and then unleashed us onto the universe and everybody was thinking, oh, you know, I'll be the one. There's that, you know, art school confidential. Yeah. Dan Klaus yeah. also went to SAIC. And oh, yeah? when I first saw that, I was like, yeah, he's, he's speaking for all of us here. Tampon and a teacup? Was that you? Was hmm? it the tampon and a teacup? Was no, that, oh, good. no, no. <laughs> Alas. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a weird world, you know. And the people that I went to school with do all kinds of things. But... The major thing that art school is good for, I think, is is kind of teaching you how to see and think, and you know, it's a very uh, it's a very particular kind of education that's sort of universally applicable. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's sort of like if you went to St. John's or something, you know. It's, yes, I did. Did you? St. John's College. Yes, I yes. did not know that. Yeah, I was at an alumni event for it just last night, as a <gasps> matter of fact. Yeah, I, oh. I did the great. Well, I, I did the Graduate Institute there because. I went to the anti-St. John's for my undergrad, uh, Hampshire College, which is okay. be trippy, design your own curriculum, sure, et cetera. Sure. Um, in between junior and senior years, I studied Attic Greek down at Annapolis with a, a tutor from St. John's and decided, oh, that's what I should have been doing. So my senior year of Hampshire was basically spent trying to get approval or get acceptance to the Graduate Institute for the moment I finished Hampshire. Um, yeah, it was oh. absolutely transformative. Um, okay. you know, yeah, see, experience. that's my life I didn't live. You know, that was the only yeah. other college I considered. And it's, now I think, oh, you know, I'd, I'd be so much better read if I had done that. <laughs> it's, it's the thing I tell people, and it's being surrounded by 30 or 40 of them yesterday. It, the idea was it was the uh, new, recent graduate reception. And they wanted people to talk about publishing, so they brought in an author, a journalist, and a guy with a podcast. It doesn't make any sense. But anyway, I, I came in to talk about this whole business. Um, and yeah, there was a degree of, we're well read, but what we're really good at is learning. Mm -hmm. And that's what you learn how to do while you're there. You don't get taught so much as you, you learn. Um, yeah. And it's... 
it's something I just have a very difficult time conveying to, to normal people who don't really get the whole business. How did you learn about St. John's? I think they sent me a glossy brochure or something you were one when of those I was people? 17. Okay, yeah. you know? <laughs> I was on some list somewhere for God knows what reason. But yeah, um, no, back in the day, it was kind of a lovely period, as I recall, where like the mail would come every day and it would be all these insane the smooth world of opportunity in paper. Terms of yeah, yeah. it's gorgeous catalogs, and you're just like, wow, how much does that one cost? Ha ha ha. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah, no, we were referred to as the school for hyperliterate misfits um, back in the 90s when Harold Bloom's Western Canon book came out. They, they quoted our dean, who has the unfortunate, or had the unfortunate name of Eva Brand, and um, who I did a great podcast with a couple of years ago. Um, but it said St. John's College, comma, school for hyperliterate misfits, which we would have been offended by, but really it was pretty accurate when, when you get down to it. Um, how have students changed for you? You said it's been essentially since you finished school that you've been teaching in one context or another. Yeah, I started teaching in 1987 when I was 23, and I only stopped in 2015, so... 28 years. A lot of years, yeah. Um, and most of the time I was teaching various kinds of studio art, but I also taught... Uh, writing classes mm -hmm. so and some things that were kind of a mix of both because our program was interdisciplinary but how have students changed boy um well I remember when I was a student the way we seemed to ourselves I mean I was a college student from 81 to 85 and the way we seemed to ourselves was very punk and like we you know, we didn't want nobody, nobody sent, you know, like yeah. we could be taught, but we, SASC had no dorms, there was no infrastructure, people lived in these crappy apartments on the west side, mostly because it was cheap, and, you know, I meanwhile lived with my parents in, you know, Evanston, so, you know, I was... Did you regret that? A little bit, but, um, you know, we had to save money because yeah. we, we couldn't actually really afford... SSC, so we were scrimping and saving to do it. And um, so, yeah, it was, uh, you know, this, this kind of period where everything was uh, just kind of, I don't know, gritty. Mm -hmm. And uh, I look at students now, and they all seem very anxious. And I can definitely understand why in this world you would be anxious and you know, no judgment, no blame. I, I really do get it. But I think to myself, oh my God, if I could only lend them some of our assholery, yeah. you know, it might it Is might it help a sense them. of anxious, uh, anxiety and, and trying to please teachers and, and professors or just a general... No, like a, a kind of, oh shit, the world, you know, yeah. I mean... But you're 19, 20 years old, that's the time to say, well... Yeah, well... Yeah. Uh, you know, I can see it, though, because a lot of them, you know, they're... Uh, at, at the college that I spent most of my time teaching at, Columbia in Chicago, uh, a lot of those folks are the first people in their families to be college students. Mm -hmm. So I think that the combination of the student loans, the pressure... Yeah. We have to make this worth it to... Yeah. I mean, Columbia is a kind of... Or it was, anyway. Now it's being run by business people, more or less, but... Back in the day, it was kind of this bizarre socialist experiment where they would have open admissions. So you didn't need any particular GPA. You didn't need, you know, yeah. great SAT scores. You just needed the willingness to come and try it out. And so there was, there was kind of a high crash and burn rate um, amongst the students. But, you know, the ones, the ones who took to it really took to it. I mean, for a lot of them, it was a chance to really shine because a lot of them really should have been artists, but you know, they might've had dyslexia or something that was keeping their grades kind of awful mm -hmm. in high school. So You mentioned uh, doing again, studio art and writing classes. How do the approaches to that differ? And that'll also get us to the question of you writing prose and you doing, you know, We'll say comics. I know it's it's illustrated, whatever. No, but no, we'll I, say, I comics. say comics too. Good. Okay. Yeah. The only reason I 
didn't claim the comics label is because I thought the comics people wouldn't want me. <laughs> oh, they're they're ridiculously uh, um, well, their standards are low. I'll just put it that way. I'm well, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, but, but they're also very argumentative about That's terminology. True. Yeah. So I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just I won't say it's a graphic novel. I'll just I'll just say it's, it's a thing. An, you know, it's an illustrated work of yeah whatever yeah, but visual book everybody was oh, yeah, like she's one. too snobby to uh, be yeah she doesn't want to be with us that's <laughs> yeah so that backfired but whatever uh, but um, yeah the, the, both teaching visual figured, versus writing and 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 being yeah so i mean i've always done both mm -hmm. and i was always trying to get both of them together and for a very short period i was a performance artist because i thought well that's the way to get together you know you do yeah. that do the writing and then you do the performance and then you got it together but the problem with that of course is it's very ephemeral and um and i started as a printmaker so then i it, it sort of occurred to me somewhere along the line that printing and words and images all went together yeah yeah do you um, have a, a moment of realization yeah. that it was it was put together as a, a comic ultimately that, that that was the form that kind of brings those things into one place um I have a pretty holistic idea about what a book is and what can be in a book. Yeah. And so, um, I mean, my own work tends to be codexes with pages and, yeah. you know, very traditional looking books. But the things I've helped midwife into being have been wildly various. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, no, there was definitely a moment, um, I think I was about 14, I was standing in Crocs and Brentanos, and I saw a paperback reprint of God's Man by Lind Ward, yeah, yeah. which of course is wordless, yeah, mostly. But I remember looking at that and thinking, oh, I could make that. Like, I already had the skills to make that. And, uh, and then I started to look for odd books. And there weren't so many back then. It was, yeah, this, this would have been 70s, right? Yeah, this would be 77. Mm -hmm. And uh, But once in a while you'd see something. You know, there'd be the Max Ernst collage novels or um, various reprints of medieval Book of Hours, something like that. And so I started to find these reprinted things and occasionally see something in a library or museum. Um, there was this amazing book called The Waking Dream that was an anthology of fantastical prints from about four centuries of printmaking. And it was everything from old dances of death, playing cards, Dürer, Bosch, up till the Surrealists, pretty much. Mm -hmm. And that was a great thing. The, the, the reproduction quality was terrible, but the... The curating was great, and that was food for thought because I thought, oh my goodness, my sensibility goes right back through, and and there are people out there right now who probably like this stuff too. And then I felt a little bit less like an oddball because the '70s were, you know, kind of the heyday of conceptual and performance coming into its own. And so I, I remember thinking to myself, well, I don't really want to be Agnes Martin though I admire her tremendously. Yeah. So what what am I going to do here in art school where everybody looks at what I'm doing and says, oh, well, yeah, but... so I was I was just allowed to go my own way in art school. I was so... Misfit. Well, mm -hmm. not even that. I was so Teflon-coated and, and mm -hmm. full of uh, the will to kill people if they didn't <laughs> go along with what I wanted to do. So, like, as an art student... I, I had a few teachers who were just fantastic and everybody else just kind of... Yeah, she's rolling, let her go. Yeah. Let me be. Yeah. Yeah. Were you tempted to move from Chicago to either New York, San Francisco, just because of the performance side of things, or was there enough of a scene? Uh, Chicago had an amazing performance scene. Yeah. Um, but I wasn't enough of... I, I wasn't good enough as a performance artist. I wasn't committed enough. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was not really fitting in very well. I want to tell stories. Yeah. Um, but I thought I was going to move to New York, and I came in 83 for the first time. Yeah. And it was January. Oh. 
And yeah. I flew into Newark, <laughs> and I I ended up, you know, took a bus to Grand Central Station, and I got out, and I looked around, and uh, New York was having a garbage strike. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we were. <laughs> yeah. So it's a good thing it was January, because the garbage was t- piled up about 20 feet high, and, you know, New Didn't York Didn't smell was, as bad, because, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The sm- it kept the smell down, but I was like, all right, you know, I'm not going to live here, because this is vile. And it was. Yeah. yeah so and, and now no one can afford to live here, so it's no, a trade-off. No. Yeah. Well, I couldn't have afforded to live here then. I mean, my friends were all living in... Yeah. One, one friend of mine who I was crashing with lived in Brooklyn, and I've forgotten where, but the week before I shared up, the warehouse across the street from where they were squatting uh, had burned down. So there was this big reeking wreck across the street, and Reagan had pretty much just set all the homeless people off into the out of doors to languish. And, uh, yeah, New York was in bad shape. And I mean, these days you look around and you're like, Oh, well, you know, this is viable. There's still a lot of garbage in the streets, but you know, it's a whole different thing. But if you try and look at what rents are like, you will. Yeah. I know. That's the end of that. (laughs) Although Gary Trudeau lives across the street from here. Ah, so I've been told. I haven't seen him in any of the times I've I've come by this place. But you know, you, you haven't might, asked him to come do the podcast. He might know I'm stalking if I do that. So you oh. know, I figured I may as well keep a couple of people on the the long term. No, list, I bet he'd really like it. He could just wander across the street. That's and, I'll, I'll see my pals right over here. I could even come to your place. And yeah, <laughs> uh, I, although I have seen uh, one of my guests does have an original Doonesbury strip um, on his wall, which. It's always nice going into to guests' homes and actually seeing some of the art and such that they uh, you know they put it together over the years. The printmaking thing, though, did that have a an origin point for you, or is that just the the form of art you initially kind of found for yourself? Um, Do you remember when that became the I'm yeah, going to work on this? So the the starting point of a lot of things was. I went to high school, and about two weeks in, my freshman year, I got an ear infection. And so I spent, I don't know, a week, maybe two, lying on the couch and moaning. And my mother, who is also an artist, uh, went to the library and came back with a huge stack of art books and said, here you go, you know, entertain yourself. And, uh, and you said, Mom, you have a weird idea of entertainment? Or no, no, did you no, dive this in? is the best idea. Good. Okay. Um, and one of the things she brought was Brian Reed's wonderful book on Aubrey Beardsley. Um, and so I just, I have no idea what else was in that stack, but that's the one that I really fixed yeah. on. And I got so excited about his line quality, in addition to the fact that these images were really strange. And I've always liked Japanese prints Mm -hmm. from probably the first time I ever saw one, which I can't even remember. So I just got really, really, really into Beardsley and started trying to draw that way, you know, and got a dip pen and the whole bit. And my mother had been a calligrapher at some point, so she had all this stuff around the house. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm sitting there imitating. And uh, somebody... I knew um, in high school who was a senior, you know, I'm a little freshman, but she was a senior and very sophisticated person. And she said, oh, well, if you like to draw like that, you would probably like etching, and you should go to the art office and see if Mr. Wimmer will teach you how to etch. And my high school was huge, about 4,000 students. Jeez. But that was actually fewer students than there had been at the height of the baby boom. Mm-hmm. And so um, there used to be printmaking classes, but there weren't at this time. So, you know, I was like 14, 15, what do I know? So I just rolled up to the door and, you know, knocked on the door. And this guy stuck his head out, and he looked just like an owl. He had these huge glasses that kind of magnified his eyes. And, uh, you know, he always wore like this kind of pullover sweater with a little V and everything. Um and, and I you said, said, I want to see your etchings. And he said, I thought you'd never... Et-. I'm just kidding. Go, yeah, go on. <laughs> no, he, uh, he said, can I help you? And I said, oh, Becky Heideman said that uh, you would teach me how to etch. And he said, all right. And uh, he pretty much stayed after school, I don't know, three or four days a week for the next three years, teaching me just one-on-one how to etch. Mm-hmm. And uh, 
you know, never look back. I mean, he was amazing. You know, like, is that one teacher who just completely sets you on your path? Has anyone ever gotten back to you and said you've been that person for them? Weirdly, somebody just emailed me last week and um, basically, you know, said more or less that. Yeah. You know, that their life had completely changed because they took my class and That'll spelled out feel. how, and it was very nice. Yeah. yeah. You feel good? Yeah. It's a good thing. It's... Makes it, makes it worth all the, all the anxiety and, you know, pains that you go through trying to, trying to teach. But... You know, I mean, for everybody who you really are that perfect person, there's going to be people who, yeah, you know, yeah, you're, just bounce right off. Yeah, so. That's why you have to have diamonds and you have to have the rough. So, yeah. you know, it... it, it well, it that I think is why you need programs with a fair number of faculty, you know. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I mean, these tiny programs, it's good in a way because you get a lot of specialized attention, but I think if the students can sort of look around and go, oh, I want that or you know that seems attractive and then wander over toward that person you know i this business of having everything be small it seems to me that it's it's just better if the students can use their at least their time of um their undergraduate degree if they can wander a little bit and be a little unfocused and Mm -hmm not know what they're doing and you know be, be, everybody, everybody's got this idea that it's got to lead to a job yeah and again that's our our issue with trying to explain St. John's to people that you don't come out of it with a certification for a particular job but you can do almost anything if you yeah. come out of that program because you you know how to know stuff yeah um, yeah I, I think there's a a great deal of the vocational tech aspect of higher education now that's you know Nothing, yeah. nothing I studied at any point trained me for what I do today. It's something yeah. I actually told my, my undergrad uh, uh, institution. I went in to speak maybe eight or nine years after I graduated. They had me come in. Um, I just told them, don't focus on anything too much in college because you're going to get a job in that field. You're going to hate it by the time you're 25, and you're going to spend the rest of your time wishing you'd studied something else in college. So, geez. Be flexible, you know. It's it's. Yeah. But I was in a position to tell people that because I was thirty, for God's sake, you know. I knew everything. <laughs> yeah, but it's good though, you know, because I mean, we're going to live long, and they expect people to work until they're a hundred and two. So you're going to have a lot of yeah. jobs and even a lot of careers. I mean, there's no there's no reason to give people this mindset when they're young that they're a failure if they don't do the thing that they studied in school. Right. And at least in America, we do seem to have that idea of flexibility um, or mobility, I suppose, yeah. uh, as opposed to um, at least friends of mine from England who kind of talk about the the tracks you get put on educationally and how you do not escape class yeah. very, very effectively in, in that world. Tell me about prose versus comics. When you decide, when you're, when you're writing something, how do you figure out what form you're working in? Or when does the form make sense to you? Well, it's interesting to try something in both forms. Like the Night Bookmobile, which is my one solo foray into a published comic, um, that started off as a short story. And then I adapted it because the guardian had asked me to do a serialized comic and it was very interesting to see how to turn the words into pictures and what could be told visually and sort of what were the best ways to do that it was really an interesting challenge um Something I'd like to do one of these days is do an entire book that would be just pictures mm-hmm. and no words at all. Lynn Ward? Yeah. yeah, yeah. the wordless novels are a really challenging form. But, I mean, one thing about prose is that it's incredibly speedy compared to drawing it. Yeah. And so, and, and it also, it, if, you're, if you make a picture you have a certain kind of specificity. You know, we know the girl 
has a certain shade of red dress and that she's got this style of shoe and even what shape her fingers are and yeah. the look in her eye and all this. Whereas if I describe all that in words, everybody reading it will have a slightly different girl in their head. Oh, Richard Cadry, I did uh, one with him a few weeks ago. He's been doing these Sandman Slim urban horror novel or urban fantasy novels. He's done 10 of them now. Never really describes what the lead character looks like. So they leave it open. He's he's kind of tall, maybe a little thin, but yeah. you know, just leaves it there and, yeah, and yeah. figures the reader can fill in the blanks as, uh, as necessary. Sure. So, um, but along those lines, then, what do you what do you learn about writing from drawing? Are there aspects that you thought I didn't have to write this much? I can I can pare things down. Or conversely, are there things that you realize there's a particular value in the the words? Well, the thing you can never, ever get with the pictures is speech. And it's very hard to move time around in a single image. So well, we those... do have a copy of Richard Maguire's here yeah, that's over there. Book. So that's uh, <laughs> the one guy that's, who kind of broke that whole mold. Yeah, mold, that's but... kind of a one-off there. Yeah, you know? That's a yeah. technique that can never be used again, right? right? Um. But yeah, there's there's just certain things that words lend themselves to and pictures lend themselves to. And the fusion, obviously, you get the advantages of both, which is why I think comics is really kind of perfect. But um, yeah, it's it's interesting because when you first have an idea and then you have to actually decide what it should be, there's... So many possibilities. And for me, a lot of it used to be dictated by the fact that I didn't have any money at all. So, yeah. I mean, Time Traveler's Wife, I thought, well, this, this could be a novel or it could be a movie. But making it as one of these stories told in aquatints is just not going to happen because I'll never finish it. You know, the story would be so complicated because trying to move somebody around in time yeah. the way... It's it's something I've always wondered. Editing for cartoonists versus editing for prose. Because with prose, yeah, I can edit and move, you know, I can take this and that out. It's, ah, yeah, I already drew and inked that. Okay, now I've yeah. got to take out these panels, move other things in, and, and, you know, because I'm all about the economy of effort or laziness. Uh, so it's it's tough for me to think about, you know. Yeah, but I mean, there's there's... There's so many different ways to go at it, and I think we're certainly living in this golden age of comics where people are trying everything they can think of. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if we'll exhaust the possibilities ever, but it seems like people are experimenting wildly. Yeah. Now, the new book that you, well, it came out a few months ago, Bizarre Romance, mm -hmm. collaborative work, um, mainly comics, but also prose with illustrations with your husband, Eddie Campbell. What was the collaborative process for writing and the art as it came together? And how did that differ from your your solo work, I guess? Yeah, as a solo worker, I, I, I go so off I should also say it's a collection of stories, so that you might have different right. types of collaboration for different chapters of it. But yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, when I'm working on my own, I tend to be very private about it and not discuss it that much. And um, I'm incredibly slow. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I love to be edited, but it's, it's a whole different thing when I'm collaborating because uh, the book came into being uh, partially because we were invited by Paul Gravett my to, pal. Yeah. yeah. To um to be part of a issue of the Sunday or, or Saturday magazine in the Observer. They were doing a thing called Novelists Do Comics. And the idea was to invite a bunch of writers who don't ordinarily work in comics to team up with comics artists. And so Paul invited the two of us to do something. As and a ringer. You, you know, you got to, to yeah, sneak in. So. Yeah. Um, so I had a half-finished story that had been kind of hanging around, which 
is the first story in the book. It's called um, Thursdays, 6 to 8 p.m. And so at the time, uh, I was in Chicago and Eddie was in Brisbane, Australia. And we had been dating for, oh gosh, maybe six months, something like that. Not very long. And um, so we kind of hashed out an ending for it over the phone. And then um, Eddie started to work it out. And we were, we were doing everything either by phone or by email. And we were as far apart as you can be on the planet. <laughs> and so it was one of those things that never would have happened except for modern technology. But the process for that one was very nice because um, I drew a couple of the characters and Eddie kind of tweaked them around and put them into the comic and you know did what needed to be done with them. So in that one, I did a little bit of the drawing and he did all of the figuring out how to make yeah. it become a comic. And so that was very satisfying. And so... We got asked to do something else, which we did very happily, which is called Backward in Seville, and that's the yeah. last story in the book. So after two of them, we were like, oh, well, we might as well just keep rolling. This is so great. And so we got ourselves a book deal, and away we went. But everything that is in the book, um, except for that first one, which we finished together, was something that was already written. Mm -hmm. And essentially, I just put a giant pile of things in front of Eddie and said, here, you know, let's, let's choose, you know, what would you like to work on? Mm -hmm. And so there are things that he didn't take up that I might have put in myself, and there are things that he did take up that it wouldn't have occurred to me to do, but he made really wonderful things mm -hmm. out of them. And I mean, I know this too, that the, the shorter pieces that can be expanded work better than a longer thing that has to be cut down. Yeah, did he edit, and were you involved once he started working on, once he selected from the pile, did you interact at all in those terms, or was it a yeah, trusting okay. him to, to I mean, for the most it? part, you know, he has a superior sense of how the thing has to be in order to work mm -hmm. as, a, as a comic. And uh, for the most part, I wasn't going to arm wrestle about it. Um, the only one where we got into any kind of uh, confusion was uh, the one which is actually my favorite in the book, which is called Motion Studies. And yeah. it's a very, very tiny little thing that I wrote as a performance piece about uh, Blanche Epler, who was uh, Edward Moybridge's favorite model. And the original thing is only a couple pages long. And so it's dependent on tenses. And Eddie decided to change the tenses. And I think a couple of weeks went by before he got around to mentioning this. <laughs> and I was like, you did what? You did what? You got to do it. And um, so then he was like, oh, well, we'll talk about it later. And so months went by. And uh, we finally had to kind of grapple with it but it's already been lettered honey i'm afraid it can't be changed now pretty much yeah <laughs> pretty much. so i was initially i was wondering whether the act of working together on stories like this created any greater sense of intimacy between you in terms of of you know grappling with art together but i realized i should have been going in the opposite direction of did it create any fissures or, or difficulties <laughs> like <laughs> no i mean we the hurdles for us were Geographic. I mean, yeah. when you we we met in London, but at the time we really were living so far apart. I mean, I've crashed in the home where you have where you two met. So I've, yeah, I've hung oh. out with John and Judith. I actually hit up John and Judith before this to see if they had any questions for you guys Aww, for for this. So. That's sweet. Yeah. Well, what actually happened was that Judith had another house guest coming, and so Eddie couldn't stay on at the Clutes, and so um, Haley, Eddie's daughter, who you know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. we recorded a year or two ago okay. in incredibly hot and terrible conditions uh, in New York. Yeah, yeah, it was it was a sweaty mess. Oy. But oh, well. we dealt. Well, she's know. Australian, so she can cope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, Haley uh, got in touch and said, oh, um, my dad needs a place to stay. Can he stay at your flat? And I'm like, sure, but I'll be there. 
So uh, you didn't realize this was a parent trap thing happening. It didn't occur to you in the slightest. Okay. <laughs> she she swears that that was never the intention. So I, I don't know. I don't believe her. <laughs> she hasn't admitted to it. <laughs> you know, when you talk about both teaching and making art for for decades now, what have you gotten better at? Uh, we'll go with the teaching first. Are there aspects of? And you mentioned the anxiety. It seems never went away exactly, but. What did you find easier as a teacher? Um, when did you start to understand, without it being a, you know, uh, I could just mail it in sort uh, of thing? But. Yeah. The thing with the teaching is that I started in community education. Mm -hmm. um, so I was teaching at a local art center. And I was 23 when I started, and so my students were older than me. So at the beginning, I was a sprout, and they were adults. And I thought I knew what I was doing, and they were very patient about that. Because, um, you know, technically, I you knew stuff teach. that they didn't know. Yeah. Um, but a lot of people who are printmakers will take class just to get to use equipment. So, mm. you know, some of the people that I was uh, teaching had decades of professional experience and I knew better than to try to yeah impress you know, upon them your, your yeah, grand teach, learning teach uh, yeah. grandma to suck eggs as it were but so so over time the age thing has reversed um I remember when I was 36 and I suddenly realized that the freshmen were half my age that was a little bit of a freak out but um you know it just got to this thing where I I had several decades on my students, some of them, not all of them. And and they were just having completely different growing up experiences than what I had had. Mm -hmm. And so I started to feel really anxious sometimes when I was at school. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's wise and learn it, please. Yeah, 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 but also... But, I mean, also I, I got somewhat better at uh, listening and also just kind of quietly waiting for people to tell me stuff. Um, at the beginning of teaching, I always felt like I had to be talking, and I eventually... Did you figure out what to do with your hands? That's also a, a big thing when you're in front of a room. That's a... Yeah, a lot of the time I'm, I'm either standing at a press or in a dark room or oh, so at a drawing board. And, okay. Yeah, it's usually in, in a studio situation, it's not a problem. And I very, very seldom have lectured so usually I teach in a seminar format if I'm not in a actual studio. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that's it's never even occurred to me until you just said that. Yeah, that so hands I make yourself conscious about everything. So. No, nah. <laughs> it's only because I, I um, Clive James's unreliable memoirs talks about his first time on TV, thinking, you know, he knows everything. After all, he's done stuff on stage and lectured, et cetera. And then within a second of the camera going on, realizes I don't know what to do with my hands. Aww. And he's just kind of gesturing. He doesn't know if he's in frame, not in frame. And he's just kind of lowering and, and raising. Yeah. It gets all of us, I guess. But the question that Haley does send me is, um, ask her about taxidermy. <laughs> well, that's something that Haley, an interest Haley and I have in common. Yeah. Um, tell me about it. And what it signifies? Well, it's part of a larger interest in death. But the taxidermy in particular was sort of accidental. Um, when I was an art student, I went to a garage sale and just pretty much on a whim bought a stuffed toad for a quarter. And uh, it was kind of damaged. It had wires poking out where the hands should be. And uh, so, sort of steampunk taxidermy toad. Is that a? Yeah. Well, you know, steampunk didn't exist, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but also steampunk is trying to be something that it isn't. You know, making a new thing old mm -hmm. in some way, or grafting some technology onto yeah. a time period when it didn't exist, etc. So. I mean, the taxidermy that I have, I don't go in for blending creatures or anything like that. And mm -hmm. so most of the taxidermy I have is sort of damaged in some way. Um, I feel sorry for it and take it home. 
Is that a metaphor for something? Or? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm pretty certain it's not standing in for, you know, having kids or something. Is this something you regret at all? <laughs> not having kids? No. no. Solid. Um, I mean, also, then when I met Eddie, Eddie's got three kids, and I'm like, okay, well, you know, that's excellent because they're all amazing. And you didn't have to go through the, the upbringing, rearing Phase. Yeah, I figured, you know, I had students. I had lots and lots of students. Yeah. So anything I had to give, I gave, you know. But, yeah, I mean, it's really interesting to marry into a family where, you know, I mean, Eddie's got kids, but also he's one of six Campbell siblings. And so it's a big family, whereas my family is vanishingly small. Yeah, same here. I married into a family down in rural Louisiana, where it's a sort of world where people just walk in each other's homes all the time. And I basically might have five relatives in North America oh, wow. otherwise. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a weird trip for me. Just, okay. You just, you just show up at each other's homes and walk in. All right. Yeah. That's, that's not my world, but, uh, well, all of my friends think there's gotta be so many funny stories I have about, you know, living with this this Cajun family, uh, you know, this extended Cajun family down in uh, uh, Louisiana. I'm pretty sure they have far more stories about the weird Yankee Jewish guy who married into the family and, and shows up and talks about oddball topics like a podcast that, you know, nobody really... So do you feel like you've been, you know, kidnapped by fairies or something? Like the changeling guy? No, it's not that. I think it's a little bit of what my wife felt. She was always the the misfit artistic kid growing okay. up down there. So yeah, yeah, there was a sense of, uh, you know, they're happy. She's found, you know, true love at, at this point. Oh, but, that's good. but did you think you were going to get married? Was it ever a thing for you? I suppose. Um, I never cared all that much about whether I was married or not. I always thought it would be nice to find, you know, true the right, love, the right married. person. Yeah. yeah. It took a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I got hitched younger than you, about 35 or 36, but... Uh, yeah, I was 53. But, yeah, I know. That's, that's what I'm wondering. Is it something that it was just a, wow, how did that happen? Well, I uh, think it was all about not settling. Yeah. So. <laughs> I'm down. So, so you're, you're in New York for the Brooklyn uh, Book Fest, which is, well, it'll have already taken place by the time this airs, but um, A, what have you learned about book touring uh, over the course of your career, because book tour best practices is something I'm, I'm somewhat interested in, in learning about from you guys. But also, who are you interested in seeing while you're here? Besides, of course, the schlub from New Jersey. So. Oh, gosh. Um, well, I've been to the Brooklyn Book Fair once before, mm -hmm. and it was so much fun. And uh, so I really wanted to come back again. I haven't looked at the schedule very carefully, and so I'm not sure whether... They put so much stuff on at the same time. That's part of it. I look it over and I just thought, you know, I'm going down to Maryland for Small Press Expo instead. At least oh, I know who's there and it's a, uh, you know. Yeah, but all that to say that I'm not sure ever if we're able to go see certain people. But um, I think top of my list is probably Leanna Fink, mm -hmm. um, whose drawings I really admire. She's got this marvelously strange sensibility. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she would be tops yeah. on my list. Who were your cartooning influences? Uh, I remember when Mouse was coming out in Raw, and I remember looking at that for the first time and thinking, can you do this? <sighs> yeah. Yeah, so that significantly expanded my notion of what one could do, not only with comics, but with storytelling. Yeah. And, I had a college professor who literally told me that book shouldn't exist. She was a Russian literature professor and felt that the story was so harrowing, she didn't want it depicted. I'm like, not even at comic versus prose. I thought, well, you're teaching me a tall story in Dostoevsky right now. And, you know, those guys plumb some depths, admittedly, as fiction. But. I can understand feeling that I myself don't have the emotional stamina to contend with a particular book. Mm -hmm. um, but that other people like the painted bird man I can't tackle the painted bird yeah. I got maybe 20 pages into that and put that down um, I might try it again someday but the person I was that then I just was like no but 
Yeah, I'm sort of, I sort of feel the exact opposite. Like the really difficult stuff has to be there so that when you finally are able, you can mm -hmm. take it on. And that you have to work to become that person who can read those books because otherwise you won't know. Right. Are there any books you've been waiting on? This is an interesting thing. I'm Facebook friends with John Crowley. Yeah, yeah. Who, John's been on the show uh, yeah, a few times. Yeah, genius. Oh, God, he's, um, yeah, yes. He just posited that question on Facebook, and everybody's been jumping in with, you know, the things they have either waited on for whatever reason or things that they heard were amazing and they tried them and it wasn't for them. Mm -hmm. And so everybody's been chiming in. And um, well, It was an early question I used to do on the show. What's the book or author you didn't get when you were younger who you grew into? Not something you were assigned in school, but something you read and simply didn't get and then God, you had to so age much. into it. So much. Yeah. I was one of those people who was trying to, you know, read D.H. Lawrence when I was 12 or something. Yeah. So, you know, my mother was an English major and she had all these books. And I'll just take everything off the shelf and read it while I'm lying there with an ear infection. Well, I was like, oh, you know, important book, you know. Yeah. English majors read that book. Now, I mean, probably the biggest one that I've never tackled is Moby Dick. That's one that I want to read soon. Um, I've bounced off of uh, In Search of Lost Time several times. That one, I have a feeling, is more my speed than Moby Dick. Moby Dick is going to involve extending myself into a space that I don't feel especially invited into. In but, terms of gender? Or, yeah, in terms okay. of, yeah. Um, whereas Proust, I just have this feeling like I'll like that world once I finally get there. Yeah, yeah, I can, I can understand that. I had the... I had the experience of reading the first Elena Ferrante book and thinking, this is good, but I, I just, I'm too much of a guy. And I know there are men who enjoyed all four books and, and you know, adored them. And I just, like, I'm sure I would appreciate this a lot more if I was female and, and experienced yeah. female friendship. Yeah. But, well, it's funny know. because when everybody was reading those, mm -hmm. I hadn't read them and I still haven't. Yeah. And they're on my list of things to read. But I was uh, purely... By accident, I was uh, having dinner with um, Lana Wachowski and David Mitchell mm -hmm. and a bunch of other people. And they were like, have you read the Frante books? And I'm like, no. And they proceeded to just rave about them yeah. for half an hour. And I thought, wow, okay, there's a recommendation, man. That's like, you know, yeah, the best yeah, that's ad cool. for those books ever. You know, so there's, you know, two people who... Fall in, I was know, gonna say they cover a spectrum of really human experience, different so. places on the gender yeah. identification scale, but both enjoyed those books so much, and I thought, well, that's that's good, you know, because I mean, what is what is fiction for if not to be somebody you're not? Oh, I'm so, down. I, yeah, I just you know. as I liked it and felt, yeah, I, I could read more of these. I'm not driven like most sure. people I know who read them. Uh, one of my guests told me she basically took a month off and just read all four of them oh, uh, wow. because she just wanted to. You know, get through that whole, not get through, experience the whole shebang. Sure. Um, me, I experienced that with The Leopard by Giuseppe Lampedusa. That was my, you yeah. know, finish it, go back and start it all over again. But, yeah. Um, I mean, the last book that I had been putting off reading or bounced off of, um, I, was, I was in London and I got to see a performance of The Master and Margarita by um, Complicity. I keep failing to start that. I've had three different guests who've kicked my ass for not having read it yet. I uh, won't kick your ass. Because like, you're in the same boat? You, oh my God, that is the most amazing book. That is son of a so bitch, funny, man. so weird. Fine, I'll read it this winter. That's, oh my that's... God, oh my God. Yeah, just, I don't know. It's, I mean, if you, if you appreciate the absurd... And you have a surrealist bone in your body. I mean, also if you know his life story. Yeah. And, and the publication history you were talking about, you know, we never did talk much about book touring, but we'll get back if to you're, if you're into the history of publishing, the path of that novel to publication is one of the most yeah. interesting that I know of. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, tell me about book tours. What yeah, have you learned? Book tours. Well, I've been on many kinds of book tours. Um, the original publisher of The Time Traveler's Wife was McAdam Cage in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know anything about them, no, but they were 
a very small but very plucky publisher and David Poindexter, who was the main, you know, the publisher, um, had, I think, decided to go at publishing as though it was the 1940s. And so he was, he was supreme at this kind of laid-back Californian gentleman attitude toward the whole thing. And he had, you know, he'd created this thing, and it was beautiful while it lasted. And uh, I just happened to get scooped up by them. And so they, they signed my book, and they sent me on a 17-city tour for a debut novel. Okay. And uh, I was helped by the fact that the film rights had been optioned by um, New Line Cinema, but also Plan B, which was Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston's company. Mm -hmm. And so there was all this buzz about them all yeah. the time. I mean, you couldn't stand in line at the supermarket and not say something about them at the time. So, yeah, they sent me on tour, and the first couple stops on the tour, the first stop was D.C., and um, I think 12 people came, which was great. You know, yay. I felt that First that time was... debut author. That's, that's yeah. something. I was like, I'm nobody, and there are 12 people here, and that's fantastic. And then... Um, See, I think the next thing was I was in Memphis, which was good in an entirely different way because the author escort there was this wonderful dude, very unorthodox author escort. He was taking people around in this Volvo that had like 300,000 miles on it. And he was this very, very interesting human who had done and seen everything and was a fantastic conversationalist. So I had a great time in Memphis and he took me, we had great meals, all good. You know, got to go to Burke's Books for the first time, which is this magnificent, wonderful indie. So, you know, so I was just sort of treating book tour like it was this funny vacation involving visiting a lot of bookstores. But then um, the next uh, bookstore was in, uh, was a, it was a little shop in Blaville, Arkansas. And I, I was there on a, I think a, a Saturday or a Sunday, it was pouring rain, and there was somehow also a high school football game that everybody in the whole region had to attend. And so it was one of those ones where you show up and the bookstore people come and like sit in the yeah. chairs to help Fill you seats. pretend that you're actually accomplishing something. Mm -hmm. And uh, the woman who owned that store, you know, she was super nice, but um, Hillary Clinton had been there the week before, and <laughs> they had hundreds of people, and Lines going out the door. Lines, yeah. you know, they had to have tickets and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, I I went away from there with my tail between my legs. And uh, and then a few days later, I was on the Today Show because they had a book club at the time and Scott Tarot had very kindly chosen my book. And that that was the, just in the entire turning point in my life, probably, because TV, um, back when TV could really... Yeah. do something and everybody was more or less having their attention on the same things. I mean, this was in 2003. What was the Tarot connection? A Chicago guy, right? Uh, yeah, so Scott's uh, ex-wife, Annette, they were still married. This could be a horrible time. story or, or I shouldn't have asked, no. but okay. <laughs> um, so Annette is a painter ah, okay. and I knew her through art world and teaching and all those things and uh, so because I was a person who didn't have a lot of connection to the literary world, when I was asked to help get blurbs, uh, well, I... Well, Scott Turow help sell books? Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. I called Annette, and I'm like, I, I realize that this is a huge favor and that it's not a thriller and that he probably won't like it. And she said, well, I'll tell you what, Audrey, look, I'll read it, and if I like it, I'll try to see if Scott might read it. And so the next thing I know, not only did he blurb it, which was really super, but he picked it for this thing. <laughs> and I was like, yeah. oh, my God, Scott, you're great. Annette, you're fantastic. Wow. What nice people. So that was kind of the turning point. But so I went on the Today Show. And from then on, the tour actually was like 
you know, a proper tour with like people showing up and everything. But about a year later, when the paperback came out, um, BEA was in Chicago. And um, my, my paperback publisher, Harcourt, had a, a dinner for um, myself and Emma Donahue. Mm -hmm. uh, this is before Room came out. And that was pretty nice. And, you know, we were just kind of there doing our thing. And this woman comes up to me, who I dimly recognize. And when she starts speaking, I realize that it's the bookshop owner from Blaville. <laughs> yeah. And she says to me, now, when you were in my store, did you know that you were going to be on a day show? And I'm like, uh, yeah, they, they don't let you tell anybody. And she just, she shook her head. She said, and you never said a thing. And, you know, you could tell that she just wanted to bot me. <laughs> so anyway, you know, if, if, if she's listening to this, I'm sorry that I didn't tell you. <laughs> it was on the Today Show. You can go back and promote later. But, yeah, yeah, anyway. But um, touring at all for Bizarre Romance, I've seen you at a couple of, well, we saw you at Toronto and, and now this. Um, different sort of audience? when it's comics related as opposed to prose or have those converged enough that it's simply an Audrey slash Eddie audience? I, think, I mean, we've been doing a very comic centric, uh, mm -hmm. bunch of promotion for this. So yeah, we did TCAF, you know, hung out in Toronto. That's an incredibly groovy. Oh, it's a great show. It's the only one my wife will go to. I can most, see why. Most other comics festivals. Yeah. To, Android's dungeon. <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it's... Well, this yeah. is in a library, so already oh, you've got the fantastic library, yeah. and then there's all these very nice people, and they're great books, and, and lots of artists. And fantastic dining. There yeah. are really great restaurants in Toronto. Yeah. So uh, if you guys go back one year, we'll invite you along, because there's this one Chinese place we go to every year on the last day of the show um, that is the greatest Chinese restaurant in North America. Oh, okay. um, yeah, it's... Wow. it's um, it's a lot of fun. That's cool. We took Jaime Hernandez this past time, so, you know, okay. indoctrinated him into the, the Lai Wahin experience. But, <laughs> cool. But we'll see. But, Audrey, thanks so much for coming on the show. Oh, it's a delight. Thank you very much. Again. And that was Audrey Niffenegger. Her newest book is Bizarre Romance from Abrams in collaboration with her husband, the cartoonist Eddie Campbell. You should check out both her prose and her illustrated work, and you can find more about her. Well, I mean, you can go to Amazon and just search her out, but you should go to her site, AudreyNiffenegger.com, for more about her, and she'll have blog posts there, examples of her artwork, and all sorts of stuff. Of course, that involves spelling Audrey Niffenegger correctly. So to do that, it is A U D R. E Y N I F F E N E G G E R, just like it sounds, dot com. Uh, she's also on Twitter as A A Niffenegger, and there's also an Instagram account under the same name, but she hasn't posted there yet. Now, after we wrapped, I asked Audrey, So, who are you reading? If you want to hear her answer to that, you'll need to become a supporter of the Virtual Memories Show so you can get access to our quarterly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet. The newest episode features book recommendations from last quarter's Virtual Memories Show guests, including Stephen Heller, Dean Haspiel, Jaime Hernandez, J.J. Settlemeyer, Michael Kupperman, Ilana Meyer, Chris Brown, Urban Ungar, Alberto Manguel, Chris Reynolds, and Dave Calver. You can support the Virtual Memories Show via patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. And there are all sorts of goals and goodies in place for patrons, including that podcast, patron-only blog, handwritten show notes for every episode, my secret project, and more. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. Now, I recorded this episode at the home of my pal, Jesse Scheidlauer, in New York City. Thanks, Jesse. Uh, this one cost me 12 bucks for the toll at the George Washington, uh, $29 for parking garage, and 2 or 3 bucks for coffee. I also recorded with Eddie Campbell at the same session, so that's two episodes for the price of one. 
Still, if you want to help defray some of the costs of the virtual memory show, like web hosting, travel, equipment, coffee, or just toss me some money because you think the show is worth it, then visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod and make a one-time or recurring donation. Special thanks go out to Joe Caruso, Michael Hacker, Michael Janizek, Paul Karasik, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Jack Les Camella, Teresa Lewis, Stephen Nadler, Payne Prophet, Dmitry Samarov, Stephen Solomon, Greg P. Stephan, Greg Tanner, Ford Thomas, Noah Van Skyver, and Garrett Zecker for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories Show. We have the full list of show supporters at chimeraobscura.com slash vm. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thank you so much for listening. We'll be back next week with Ken Krimstein, who's got a brand new graphic novel out called The Three Escapes of Hannah Arendt. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. That'll help us build a bigger audience. And you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. Thank you.